Good evening, future FAST students. Congratulations and thank you so much for joining us today. We would like to recognize that all three of SFU's campuses are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Kakite, Semiamu, Tawasan, and Katsi Nations. My name is Madison and I'm a student recruitment coordinator from SFU's recruitment and admissions team and I'm one of your hosts for today's events. I'm also joined by my esteemed colleagues, Caitlin Davis, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Coordinator of Recruitment, Community Outreach and Student Engagement. And I'm also joined by Rebecca Sanguis, the Indigenous Student Recruitment Coordinator. I will have Caitlin introduce her own team in a bit. At SFU, we have three campuses, eight faculties, 84 research institutions, and are ranked the number one comprehensive university in Canada. So if you're interested in doing research, you have come to the right place. We currently have over 30,000 students enrolled and enrolled at SFU and just under 10,000 that are currently participating in co-ops and other work experiences. A fun fact about SFU is that we are the only Canadian institution to participate in the NCAA where our varsity athletes compete against US teams. At SFU, the community is an integral a part of being a student. From clubs to student unions to recreational sports, there is something here for you. To build on our SFU community, we've just recently completed our brand new student union building. Our incoming fall 2021 class will get to be one of the first groups to use the new building if we are back on campus in the fall. We also have a new stadium coming along uh, so far this year. The stadium should be opening also this fall. There will be even more opportunities to spectate our varsity sports such as football, track and field, and soccer once we can safely gather again. We also have new residences opening this May, where we have brand new single occupancy rooms, common spaces, opportunities to collaborate, and spaces to find comfort within your new surroundings. Another of our many benefits of being an SFU student is graduating into a network of over 170,000 proud alumni from over 43 countries. Not only will you be a part of a strong community while you are a student, but to continue to be a part of one once you graduate. Currently, there will be an update in regards to the status of our fall semester in May. SFU is working collaboratively within the community and with our provincial government to safely reopen our doors. If you have any specific questions about our COVID-19 protocols or any other questions for that matter, we will be having a Q&A period at the end of today's presentation. Once again, thank you and thank you for joining us today. Congratulations, I will now pass it over to Caitlin. Thanks, Madison. I'm actually going to be passing it directly on to Dr. Paul Boudra, who is going to be uh, the moderator for the FAST Great Debate tonight. And I will be joining back uh, during the Q&A period at the end. So Dr. Paul Boudra, feel free to take it away. Thank you very much, Caitlin and Madison. So hello, everyone, and congratulations on your offer to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at SFU. This is the largest and most diverse faculty in the university. And thank you for joining us tonight for the FAST Great Debate. As mentioned, my name is Paul Budra. I'm a professor in the Department of English and I specialize in Shakespeare. Now today, several faculty members and academic advisors will be debating topics of great import and dire significance. And you will vote using an electronic poll to determine the winner of each debate. And there'll be a Q&A period at the end of the event to answer any questions you have about joining SFU in the fall. And by the way, if you end up enjoying this event, uh, once you're at SFU, watch out for the annual SmackDown debate, which is a larger format version of this debate, which is an annual fundraiser for the United Way. So now the debaters will discuss highly essential questions in pairs. One proponent will be speaking in favor of a resolution, the other one against, and you, the audience, will have the opportunity to vote on the winner of each debate. At the very end, the audience will also have the opportunity to select the pair who debated the best. Each debater will have two minutes to defend their point of view, after which we will go to the other debater. I will signal when the time is up with the ukulele of extreme prejudice. Uh, so when they hear the sound, they know it's time to wrap up. Uh, the debaters will now be introduced by pairs of FAST students. So let's begin with our first introductions and go to our first students. Hello, everyone. My name is Rahina, and I'm a third year student majoring in sociology and minoring in Indigenous studies. Today, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Susanna Crage. 
Susanna Crage is a professor of sociology and is chair of the undergraduate sociology and anthropology program. You might get to meet her in Introduction to Sociology or in a quantitative research class. Susanna has many different research interests, including developments in higher education and student culture, immigration and asylum, national identity, Germany, and the European Union. Hello, I am Emerald. I'm a fifth year English major with also a certificate in writing and rhetoric, which you don't have to be an English major to get. I'm here to introduce Dr. Sean Zweigerman, who is an associate professor in the English department and an associate dean of graduate and postdoctoral studies in FAS, which is incredibly impressive to be doing both of those things at once. Dr. Zweigerman teaches courses in writing and rhetoric, and his research interests include speech act theory, unpersuadability, and humor, if that is any pressure for today's debate. If you're interested in taking a class with Dr. Zweigerman, he'll be teaching English 114 this summer, which is called Language and Purpose, and typically teaches English 375 or English 475 in the spring terms. Great, thank you very much. All right, let's go on to our first debate topic. Be it resolved that there is only one direction that toilet paper can unroll, it must go over. Arguing in favor of this proposition is Dr. Craig. Dr. Craig, over to you, you have two minutes starting now. Okay, as a sociologist, I teach about the importance of gathering data about social issues. So I'm gonna draw on research as I talk about this topic, which really is important because as everybody realizes there is a right. You think people don't care? Let's just look at the number of Reddit threads on the topic. This keeps going, but even if you don't think you care for yourself, you might wanna to care to learn about others. A 2016 survey by the busiest television therapist in the business found that overs tend to be overachievers while unders tend to be more relaxed. No, changing how you hang your toilet paper isn't gonna magically make you more successful or more relaxed. That's not how these findings work. Really the most important reason to care, again, is there actually is a right, which is the way I do it. Um, not that I'm saying that's the only reason that way is the right way. Let's start with numbers. In every single survey on the topic, the majority prefers over. And even if you've moved past the stage of being ruled by popularity contests, over is still better. It's easier to find and grab the toilet paper's loose end. In fact, movement people find that the motion needed to pull over toilet paper is more efficient which is great because at that point, I really just kind of want to move on with my life. Um, probably most important though, is it does seem to be safer. It reduces germ transfer from the toilet paper touching the germ filled wall and your hand touching the wall and all of that stuff. That said, I have to give under its due. I realized that many of our preferences and opinions are related to our places in society and the types of roles we play. And this applies to me too. For instance, I'm not an RVer. And in moving vehicles, under toilet paper is less likely to accidentally unroll. This is also the case during earthquakes, but frankly, whenever I've been in an earthquake, that hasn't actually been my top concern. Also, I do realize that there are people whose life circumstances may be shaped by large forces that overpowered the greater popularity, the better ergonomics, and the reduced bacterial transfer of going over. But even those people, they still really care. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Susanna. And uh, now we're going to go to Dr. Zwagerman, who is going to argue against the resolution that there is only one direction the toilet paper can unroll. Over to you, Dr. Zwagerman, you have two minutes starting now. Oh, Susanna, <laughs> your arguments are completely over the top. The very idea of a correct way to mount toilet paper reeks of enlightenment rationalism and its dynamics of power, which have had such a constipating effect on diverse ways of knowing and wiping. And you are totally missing the point, which is the toilet paper's presence in our lives in the first place. What does toilet paper represent? Whiteness. Just listen to these toilet paper brand names. Royale evokes the specter of imperialism, Cottonelle conjures images of slavery and angel soft traffics in oppressive Christian symbolism. And do I even need to mention white cloud? The bottom line here, toilet paper is racist. Asking which way to mount the roll is like seeing the KKK marching down your street and your only thought is, I wonder if they put their hoods on first or their robes. If we must use toilet paper, and I do concede 
that its use is preferable to non-use for both personal and interpersonal reasons, then let's at least work toward a less discriminatory, eliminatory experience. This need to do things the same way every time is perhaps literally anal retentive, a desire to impose heterogeneity onto a world which is full of wonder and mystery. We become more fully human when we not only embrace the unpredictable, but nurture it through our actions, allowing chance to loosen the bowels of our rigidity and restore our sense of amazement at what we spontaneously produce. By recognizing that it doesn't matter which way we load the toilet paper, we become aware of what does matter. Letting loose our massive load of undigested cultural conventions, putting the fun back in fundament and breaking through the sphincter of resistance to a world of diversity and positive change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zwagerman. Okay. Um... We're going to go now uh, to the poll to see who won that. And I will, I'm looking at the polls. Okay, here we go. Um, right now, over is winning. Over is, over, over is pulling ahead. Yeah, there seems to, seems to be a strong, strongly in favor of over, which is a few more seconds here. We've got 72% of the people have voted. Oh, um, yeah, I think, I think. I'm going to call it, yes, uh, which direction it is in is important. And the winner of this debate is Susanna. Thank you so much, Susanna. Congratulations. And now we'll ask for the students, the next set of students to introduce the speakers in our next debate. Okay, hey, hi everyone. My name is Sarah and I am a second year humanities major. Today, I will be introducing Katie. She is the undergraduate advisor in the humanities department, where she helps students navigate degree requirements, scholarship and award eligibility, grade appeals, and more. So in other words, she's in your corner. Katie is also a nature walk enthusiast and pet sitter extraordinaire. Thank you. All right, so hello everyone from wherever you're connecting with us from. So my name is Toyosi Bamboye. I'm one of the academic advisors in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. So today I'm gonna to be introducing to everyone, Phil Cunningham. So Phil is a manager and undergraduate advisor for the Department of Indigenous Studies in FAS. Similar to Katie, Phil helps students with navigating their education journey and understanding program options and requirements within the department. For anyone who's interested in exploring courses and programs options within the Indigenous Studies, Phil is your go-to guy. Phil and I share one thing in common, which is our love for football or soccer, like it is commonly called in North America. Thank you. Thank you, Tiosi, and thank you, Sarah. And uh, it looks like this is going to be a heated debate, and it is a very, very important subject. So be it resolved that a hot dog is, in fact, a sandwich. Uh, Katie will be arguing in favor of this, and Phil will be arguing against it. So Katie will be arguing that the hot dog is, in fact, a type of sandwich. Katie, you have two minutes starting now. Be it resolved that the hot dog is a sandwich. While breads and their fillings have been a part of human culture for as long as there have been agriculture and animal husbandry, our modern conception of the sandwich began in the mid 18th century when John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, requested that his valet bring him meat betwixt slices of bread so that he might eat one-handed while he gambled. Thus, I propose that the sandwich, though almost infinitely variable, must consist of a bread or bread-like outer shell that increases its contents, portability, and convenience. Picture Costco. In the absence of this dreaded pandemic, you cruise the aisles one hand on your cart, and in the other, a Polish dog you paid but $1.50 for, providing all of the vital nourishment you need to tackle your shopping list. It's portable and convenient. Is a hamburger not a sandwich? Of course it is! And how often do they accompany our humble hot dog as an offering to crowds at a ball game or family barbecue? A mobile food stuff that allows you to cheer on your team or make small talk with your great aunt while you fortify portable and convenient, not to mention celebratory. A sandwich makes it possible. And yes, a hot dog is a sandwich. 
Finally, if you will permit me, I propose that another condition of the sandwich is that it must be somewhat embarrassing to be seen eating the filling in absence of the bread shell. If I saw a man on the street shoveling slices of deli ham and shredded lettuce unaccompanied into his maw, I would turn around and go home. He needs his privacy. If I saw that same man eating all beef franks raw out of the package, he needs help immediately. Put it on a bun and be done. The hot dog is a sandwich. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, now arguing against the resolution that a hot dog is a sandwich, over to you, Phil. You have two minutes starting now. Well, those were fighting words. To borrow from obscure playwright William Shakespeare's 1599 play, Julius Caesar, cry havoc and let slip the hot dogs of war. Esteemed audience members, I put to you that a hot dog is not a sandwich. Let us begin with the Oxford English Dictionary definition of hot dog. The OED defines a hot dog as sausage meat, especially that of a Frankfurter or Wienerwurst. With this definition, bread does not factor in at all. Indeed, such a definition of hot dog offers not a single crumb of comfort to my opponent. It is simply a sausage. In addition, the OED goes on to define hot dog as a sausage, especially one served on a hot, long, and soft roll. Aye, there's the rub, a long, soft roll. Such as a hot dog bun, perhaps? Notice the choice of words here, hot dog bun, not a sandwich bun nor sandwich roll, not even sandwich bread, but a hot dog bun. This surely points to a hot dog being a distinct entity and not lumped into the category of sandwiches with their unremarkable starches. Furthermore, when I wish to partake in the gastronomical delights of a hot dog, I use this, a hot dog toaster. Notice, that there are receptacles for the aforementioned dog and for the long cylindrical buns that surround them. Now you don't get that in a mere sandwich maker. But I digest. It is clear to me and I hope clear to you, dear audience, that a hot dog is not a sandwich. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much. Well, this is a... I'm torn. I'm absolutely torn. I don't know which side I'm on. So let's go to you, the audience, and let's vote. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Uh, 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 right now, it looks like the majority of people are saying only eight people have voted. We must, it must be, uh, here we go. Here we go. More people are voting now. Uh, uh, oh. I, it, this looks like, this looks like a landslide. This looks like a landslide. I, yep, I'm going to call it absolutely a hot dog is not a sandwich. Congratulations to Phil. Well done. Well argued. And thank you, Katie. All right. Now we're going uh, to have students come and introduce our last debaters. Hi, everyone. My name is Mizuki, and I'm a fourth year world languages and literatures and English student. This evening, I'll be welcoming Dr. David Coley. Dr. David Coley is a professor and the well-loved undergraduate chair in the SFU Department of English. His most recent book is entitled Death and the Pearl Maiden, Plague Poetry England, which considered submerged discourses of plague in 14th century English poetry. This spring, he taught English 121 with the course theme from plague to COVID, literatures of pandemic. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. David Coley. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jessica Stewart and I am a fifth year history major with a minor in education and I have the honor of introducing Professor Emily O'Brien, who is an associate professor in the history department, as well as an associate professor and the undergraduate studies chair for the humanities department. She specializes in the Italian Renaissance, early modern medieval studies in Europe and 15th century humanism. I have personally had the renowned privilege of taking her History 402 Renaissance Italy, Italy class, and it really grew my love of history even more. So from one fan of Italian Renaissance to another, 
Please welcome Professor Emily O'Brien. Great, thank you, Mizuki and Jessica. All right, debaters, be it resolved that coffee is better than tea, that coffee is better than tea. Arguing in favor of this resolution is Dr. Emily O'Brien. Emily, you have two minutes starting now. Well, today is the perfect day for me to be championing the magnificent drink of coffee because April 21st is Rome's birthday. Rome, the city of coffee. So the stars are aligned for my victory. Let's begin by talking about sheer efficiency here. What's the hottest commodity these days? Time, especially today. What do we do all day? We zoom. We are defined by movement, by zoomment. It's just so busy. The world moves so fast and we have to keep up. So how does coffee help us with that? By giving you the option to drink it fast. Espresso, the perfect drink for our Zoom lives. Have you ever heard of a shot of tea? Impossible. Now let's move to health. I know you're all very health conscious these days. And once again, coffee wins easily. No time to make broccoli for dinner? Looking for a substitute for your veggie soup and your soup sandwich lump co lunch combo? Coffee is the superior choice because why? It's made of beans. Yes, coffee beans are totally underrated as a source of vitamins, as a source of minerals. We have the false impression that vegetables have to be green. That is so 20th century. Of course, beans can also be a great source of protein, white beans, chickpeas. So why not try whipping up some coffee hummus, some kafamas, fabulous word, looking to mix it up at your next party, socially distanced get together, of course, put out some chips and salsa and some coffee bean dip. Mm -hmm. Now, could you do any of that with tea? Uh, I don't think so. It would just be left with leaves. So then there are the less healthy, but oh so satisfying foods you can make with coffee. Coffee cake, you've got coffee ice cream, you've got chocolate covered coffee beans, and then there's always Kahlua. Again, I defy you to produce a list with products like this with tea. I'm gonna go make myself some chocolate covered tea leaves. Well, moving on to something totally different, but satisfying on such a different level. Whatever language you speak in, whatever accent you use, it's hard to imagine that the word tea could ever produce the pure joy that you feel when you say the word coffee. Let's take a random language like Italian. Caffè, espresso, cappuccino, caffè corretto. And now let's try tea. Te, te. And the accent, coffee. Let's just see how beautiful coffee sounds like when you use a New York accent. I rest my case, the verdict is clear as clear as your cappuccino is not. Coffee wins, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Went a little over time there, Emily. Remember the ukulele? Oh, we got all run on time. I may have to deduct some points, I'm not sure. Uh, right now, we're gonna see the uh, opposite being argued, uh, arguing in favor of T, Dr. David Coley. Two minutes starting now, David. Okay, okay, okay. First of all, I need to apologize for being so super jazzed right now because to prepare for this debate, I went ahead and I had a single, single espresso shot, just one, just to taste it, just to make absolutely sure that tea was the superior beverage, like not the inferior beverage, since I'm not arguing for a proposition, but against it, like arguing in the negative, which I need to tell you is a harder and more difficult position from which to arguing against something because it's easier to persuade your listeners to vote for something rather than simply against it. And I mean, this is like electoral politics 101, right? So you give the people something to believe in you don't just 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 heap scorn on the coffee side however much scorn it deserves and in this case there's a lot of scorn to be heaped on the other side because coffee is not better than tea that's madness how dare you so i had i had one espresso shot and it was a little later in the day than I usually have an espresso shot. And so now I'm all buzzy and keyed up. And this was like last Thursday. And I'm super 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 sorry about it and I haven't been sleeping well or at all. So I just want to make 
Three quick points here. First, this sucks. It just sucks so bad. So thanks, coffee. I'm tired, tired, and then it gets dark. And I think finally, tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. It's like a Neil Young album, the best one, right? And then I don't know why, and I can't close my eyes, and I'm like in bed trying to see through the dark, right? Like there's a light beyond the dark. And if I just open my eyes wide enough, like a, like a dim star, I'll see it like the promise of sweet, beautiful sleep and I'm so tired. And it was like literally one espresso shot. Who does this? What substance does this to another human being? Like what fresh hell is, is, is coffee? So second, second there are like eight gazillion different kinds of tea and they all taste different and they all have different effects. So there's like chamomile, which is like good for me right now. And then there's red zinger and I love that name. And then there's Earl Grey, which is very proper. Proper, what oh, Phil Cunningham's here. Proper Phil Cunningham, what, what? And then, and then there's matcha, right? There's so many other ones and they're all different and they're all super great. But with coffee, it all kinds of tastes like coffee, right? And it's pretty much the same. And I'm trying to figure out what Emily has against diversity, right? Because it's 2021. And finally, third and, no, 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 third. No, I'm good, two, I'm good with two. Y'all are good with two, right? So tea is good, coffee is less good. That's it, thank you. I'm exhausted. Thank you, David. Uh, that was amazing. Okay, let us go to the polls and see coffee or tea. Oh, this looks neck and neck. This is close, very close, very close indeed. Wow. Okay, a few more people voting. Oh, and just by a hair, I'm calling it just by a hair. Tea wins over coffee. Have a nap, David. All yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, our debaters. And now, uh, you, the students, you get to choose. Uh, we're going to have another poll here of which debating team, which debate was the best of the three that we've had. Uh, the first one on toilet paper, the second one on hot dogs, or the last one on tea and coffee. So they're being rated here right now. Oh, wow, looks like, looks like, well, let's give it a few more seconds here. People are still voting. Come, a few more votes coming in. Okay, I think we're gonna call it. It looks like Kate Nordgrum and Phil Cunningham, the great hot dog debate were the winners. Thank you very, very much. And thanks to all our debaters and thanks to the students who introduced our uh, debaters. Thanks to all the participants. And remember, um, join the uh, students, join the 2021 undergraduate Facebook group to get connected with other incoming students and connect with FAST directly at fast.engage on Instagram and Facebook. And also, if you like this debate, remember the United Way regularly organizes a faculty smackdown debate as a fundraiser, usually in the spring term, and there'll be even more um, debaters arguing over important questions. And now we're going to go over, I'm going to return the mic over to Caitlin Davis, who's going to stick around and answer questions with some other faculty. And awesome. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So that was our debate for the night. Now, as uh, it was kind of mentioned into the chat there, there is time for a Q&A now. So um, everyone, feel free to ask any questions that you might have to any of the academic advisors we have here, any of our fantastic professors that you've met today, uh, or any of the current students that you also met. So um, any questions you have, feel free, you can put them in the chat. Um, we also might be able to, if some of you wanted to unmute yourselves to ask a question, you could do that as well. Um, all right. So we're just going to spotlight everybody who's here to answer some questions that you might have. All right, David, first question. Do you have any advice for a first year undergraduate student in terms of course loads? So this could be a question that's answered by some of our advisors, but even some current students who can give you some advice. Um, but really, it's up to the individual. Keep that in mind. Um, but if any of our advisors wanted to answer this, we could also talk to some of the students about how they uh, manage their course loads as well. So who wants to answer that one first? Any I can speak Mizuki, from you want to go? Awesome. <laughs> sure. I can speak from a student perspective. So in my first year, I didn't 
um, I took four courses, but that was without any jobs on the side. That was in, that was without volunteering, getting involved in any other way. Um, and four was manageable for me back then. But keep in mind that if you have a part-time job, if you're going to be joining clubs, your departmental student union, that is going to take up more time as well. I think the recommended course load is usually three to four courses. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Lipke. Do we have any advisors that wanted to talk about managing course loads here? Megan, awesome, go ahead. I'll just maybe build on what Mizuki said is really just, yeah, looking at what other things you have going on in your life. Um, are you working? Do you volunteer? Do you like to do things? Do you have hobbies? Really remembering that those things, including hobbies and, and whatnot are still important and creating balance. Um, I know it's really exciting when you first start at university and you want to take as many courses as possible and that's awesome and we're excited for you, but just remembering that balance is the best thing. Um, on average students are usually three and four like Mizuki said, but really look at your other commitments and, and remember that you know those things will make you happy too and a happy student always you know does well so uh, honor those parts of your life that's my best advice. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. Did you want to take the next one here? It's as an undecided major, is there a certain list of courses you need to take? Yeah, I can take that one as well, too. Um, so it's totally okay to be an undecided student. Um, I think uh, a lot of incoming students feel pressure to have to know exactly what it is they want to do or need to do, um, but that's not true at all. It's really fun to not know. Um, that means you have a lot of space to explore uh, and exploring is a, a great thing. You know, uh, you might find some courses that you really like. And I always tell students that the things that you like are gonna be the things that you do well in. But as far as courses that you have to take um, as an undecided student, SFU does have some courses that are requirements um, without getting too much into jargon. Um, there are some requirements that are uh, called WQB requirements or just electives um, that you can start doing. Uh, a bachelor's degree is 120 units. Um, if you're majoring in something or minoring in something, that's only a part of those 120 units. So there's lots of room and time for exploration. Um, and, and you can really just take things that maybe interest you uh, at the beginning. Um, but if you're feeling a bit stressed or worried about being undecided, reach out to academic advisors. That's what we're here for. Uh, and we can help you uh, figure, figure that out. And I see David Coley's hands up. Yeah, can I just jump in really quickly? Um, the, the question about being undecided is a really interesting one because I do think that there is pressure for, or there, there I think many students and incoming students do sort of sometimes feel a pressure to like declare your major now, to get yourself settled now. And especially in the first year and even the second year, I, I think it's really important to look around, to take courses that, that would challenge you to take risks, to, to look for opportunities. Um, and, and that, you know, and I see Emerald's point on the side, right, where she thought she wanted to do one thing and then halfway in she sort of changed and, and tried to do something else. That's one of the wonderful things about being at university. And, and so I would really encourage you to, I mean, I know this sounds corny, um, but I would really encourage you to sort of embrace being undecided and to try to look around and see what's out there for you, because there's a lot at this university um, that you've not experienced before in high school or even perhaps in some of your other colleges and it's worth exploring all of those things. Awesome, thank you so much. That's the, the biggest thing is really just stay curious, explore, don't be scared to take classes. Uh, and another key takeaway would be to make appointments with your academic advisors as well. Um, they're the people to help you with planning this educational journey. Um, Keep your eyes on your emails because there will be upcoming events that are, there'll be virtual, but upcoming events to help you learn some of this course planning and how to, how to get through that system. So we'll move on to the next question here. Uh, what is the average time of a seminar or a class? Now, I'm not sure if this is the average length of time of a seminar or a class, or if they're asking about time of day. Uh, so does anybody want to take a, a stab and answer that question there? Any, anyone have anything that they want to? I can go from a student's perspective, if that's okay. Awesome, yeah. Um, so uh, 
typically it does I've taken courses in the history department and a lot of them are seminar courses and typically they're anywhere between three to four hours. Um, but this was back when things were in person. I'm not sure what they're like online. Those may have changed. Um, but it really depends on um, your specific department and their seminar classes because every department is different. Um, but I would say seminars are more they're more about like speaking out and like participating in the discussion and having your chance to voice your opinion. Whereas uh, lectures are kind of like the teacher more speaking to you about the field. So if you feel like seminars are maybe not the best way for you to showcase your um, in the classroom, just make sure the seminar is a right thing for you um, instead of what maybe say uh, your friends are taking. So like, just make sure you know what you're getting involved in with the seminar and make sure you can handle it. That's all I would recommend, so. Awesome, thank you. And the average length of time of um, seminars was what the student wanted to clarify. So does anybody have a an estimate on what the average length could be? <laughs> I mean, I, I can jump in again. I'm, 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 I'm cowed by awkward silences. Um, we're looking at, you know, there, there are four hour seminars that are often divided into two hour blocks on, you know, Wednesday and Friday or Tuesday and Thursday. Um, there are a few three hour ones, but at least in the English department, which is what I'm most familiar with, most of them are four hours divided into two. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's sort of what we're looking at for the most part. Great, thank you. So there's a lot of questions uh, in the chat here. So I'm just trying to get through them, making sure I'm not missing on anything. Um, so there were some questions about finding uh, volunteer work around campus, as well as uh, advice for finding part-time jobs close to campus. So do any students have any recommendations on what they might be doing for volunteer work, how they found volunteer work around campus or different part-time jobs or how, how they found some part-time jobs? Um, I can't really see everyone's cameras right now. So if you're raising your hand, just feel free to unmute yourself uh, and answer that. And Emerald, I think I see you unmuted, so go away. Yeah, I can take this one. Um, I had a lot of on-campus jobs. Uh, there are two places that I would definitely recommend checking for volunteer work. Check myinvolvement.com. There's a lot, a lot of peer education programs at SFU, all sorts of things. For jobs, I would check Apply to work study. There's lots of department based jobs you can get. There's also an annual calling campaign where you can call alumni to raise money for scholarships that always they always recruit for that in fall and spring. I'd also really recommend if you are in if you're living in residence, I would really recommend applying to work in residence because it's excellent experience and it opens up a lot of doors. Those are just some quick things. So like my involvement, work study, and there's also my experience, which helps you find jobs kind of more out in the community. And co-op, co-op is great as well. Fantastic, thank you. Um, anyone else have anything that they wanted to add to that one quickly? I'll just check, see if any hands are raised or unmuted. Sarah, go for it. Yeah, if I could just add something. If anyone here likes to write, there's The Peak, which is SFU's independent newspaper. And as long as you're an SFU student, you can contribute and every piece you write earns you a bit of money. So that's something I did in my first year. I wrote like a couple pieces and got me like 60 bucks. So it was a little nice thing to have on the side. Awesome, thank you. Nice way to make some extra money there. Um, now, I don't know if any of our current students are transfer students or not, but we do have a student here asking for any advice for students transferring from a college. I'm just going to quickly go through. I don't know if we have any transfer students here. I don't think so. But what you can always do is Jessica. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I am a transfer student. Um, awesome. I, I transferred from Douglas. Um, and for me, I transferred in my third year. So I what the first thing that I did was I connected with my academic advisor just to make sure that all of my courses from Douglas were transferred over and I could immediately start planning to SFU, to do SFU courses. Um, so that would be my first recommendation is get in touch with your academic advisor as soon as possible, just to make sure you're on the right track. And um, as well, 
don't be afraid to take to try to take some third year courses or second year or whatever year you're in transferring um, and just uh, see how you feel about it. But definitely the first thing is get in touch with your academic advisor as soon as possible. So. Awesome. Thank you. And then just a quick edit or correction from one of the introductions um, for Sean Swigerman. He is not actually teaching English 114 this summer. Uh, it is a distance education course and he will be the supervisor for that. So it is going to be taught by a grad student. So that's just a correction <clears throat> on English 114 uh, from an introduction earlier. All right, let's see where we are with the next questions here. There's a lot going on <laughs> in the chat, so I'm just trying to make sure I can manage all of it. Um, okay, so there was one about double majoring. So how often do students double major? Is it manageable to do it in four years or uh, would it require five years? So maybe I'll get one of our uh, academic advisors to answer this one. I'm just gonna see if anyone has their hands up. I was unmuting. Any of our advisors want to answer? Rachel, maybe? Yeah, awesome. Yes. <laughs> Spotted, great eyes. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so for actually for double major, it really depends on your um, circumstances as well, in terms of whether you are working, are you going to take summer, summer off? And it really depends. There's really no um, specific timeline exactly when you will complete your degree and also depend on the program combination you choose as well. Of course, that's going to also impact in terms of um, how long it's going to take for you to complete the program. And like all others mentioned before that we have co-op, we also have volunteer experience that you really want to make sure that you get to capture the university experience and pack it to make it more fulfilling. You don't want to graduate with a degree, but you don't really have any real world experience. So that would be also something to consider as well. Great, thank you. I also All right. Have, sorry, oh, Megan, yeah, go for it. I want to add really quickly, um, just because I saw it in the chat of just how do you know um, who, you start, who your student advisor is, and we're all talking about student advisors, and I just want to make um, just a quick note that um, SFU has a team of advisors um, that are always here to support students. Um, Rachel, who was just talking, and myself are specifically uh, first-year advisors for FAST students. Um, so those are for all undeclared FAST first-year students. Um, there's also um, academic advisors in student services, and they work with all students in all faculties at the university um, who are also undeclared. Um, and when you are ready to declare and then are a declared student, then you would be reaching out to that department's academic advisor. So those are people like Katie and Phil, uh, who we both saw in the hot dog debate. They'll be your academic advisors. Um, and then maybe just a quick, quick last note on the difference between declared and not declared. Um, when you come at to SFU, um, you're an intended student in a subject matter that you indicated that you're interested in studying. That doesn't mean declared. I think a lot of students get confused on that. So just know who your advisors are, Rachel, me, student services. Um, so yeah, you know who to reach out. And I think at some point somebody put it in the chat, but I'll put it in there again. Great, thank you, Megan. And on that note, um, our next steps event that is on May 19th is going to be academic advising. So that will be with where you get to meet Megan and Rachel even further, as well as uh, Rose, who is for the FAST1 students in Surrey. I highly recommend you come to the May 19th uh, next step session. You can register for that now and you can get all of your questions answered uh, even further about this, as well as how to make an appointment to get more of that individual course planning assistance. So there is lots of questions about what do I take in my first semester as a psych student? What do I take in my first semester for CRIM? Uh, so they will help you with all of that course planning piece. So you can come to the variety of different workshops that we're having, understand what some of this university lingo is surrounding academic advising and course planning. You'll get introduced to the different systems, the, the dates and deadlines and the timelines and all of that. And then for that individual support, 
you can make appointments and you can also join these small uh, advising workshops that will be happening as well. So uh, if we're not answering your specific questions about what classes to take specifically, I recommend coming to those advising specific sessions and we can help answer that a little bit further um, and help kind of clarify some of that one. Okay, so um, I have a question here in the chat and I'm going to actually pass this on to a student. So uh, for any students, what advice would you have for someone who's been accepted into SFU? This one in particular has been homeschooled for uh, pretty much their whole life, but I would say for all students in general, how do you get uh, acquainted with university coming in? How do you meet people? How do you get engaged? Um, so if any of the current students we have here maybe want to talk about peer mentorship, uh, the departmental student unions and different ways that you can get engaged, make some friends uh, and meet some people. Uh, I'll see who wants to go first, who maybe is unmuted. Um, Mizuki, go for it. Oh, for sure, why don't I talk about departmental student unions and then Abby can talk about the peer mentorship program. Great, perfect, yes. So actually the students here are all part of DSU. So Emerald's with the English Student Union, Regina, Regina with the with SASU, Sociology and Anthropology, Sarah with Humanities, um, Jessica with History, and departmental student unions are groups of students in all um, or most FAST departments. And they organize social events, they advocate for students. And a lot of people don't know this, but you're automatically a member of your department student union just by taking a course in that department or being an intended major or minor in that department. So I would definitely say check out your departmental student union, follow them on Instagram, follow them on Facebook, wherever you want to get in touch, see what events they have going on and drop by. I think someone asked about running for a position as a president or something, and that a departmental student union is a great place to start for that. Um, that at Fast Art Engage Instagram I shared earlier, you can go there and I've we've linked all the DSUs off of that page. So it's a great place to find them. And I'll pass it over to Abby here. So um, peer mentorship is also a great way to meet new students. So it's kind of like a two in one where you make your first friend um, and as well as you can get to ask um, your mentor like any questions related. And so we usually try to pair mentors based on the same program. So if you're a history student, we base it on like maybe there we have any history um, third or fourth year students who have experience so they can give you advice on like, oh, like, what do you think of this professor? Which classes did you enjoy? And so it's a great way um, to really meet someone um, and bond with them through shared experiences. And so uh, we have two of them, which is Fast Connections in Burnaby and Fast One in Surrey. Um, and the only difference is basically like the campus that you go to, which classes um, you take uh, and Fast Connections, um, you get paired with a mentor one-on-one um, -on -one. and I know from my experience in uh, FAST 1, I remember I was a part of it in my first year and it was definitely a great way to make friends because I was put in a group with people in the same classes and so I was um, with people that I knew already from and also be able to make friends with. Um, but another way besides peer mentorship is also um, clubs are a great way to meet people. That was definitely me um, starting out in my first year. Um, when I was in Surrey, I didn't get to meet a lot of people. But when I transferred to Burnaby, taking more classes, I joined clubs. And that's what, a way that I got to meet people and like really have fun and also gain volunteer experiences. So I definitely recommend checking that out. I think I linked um a website earlier but it's just go.sfss.ca and you'll find all of the clubs um, that we have there awesome thank you so much did any of the other students have anything that they quickly wanted to add to that i'll just take a quick peek here yeah could i just quickly yep. draw attention to so we have a mentorship program within FAS, which is amazing, but SFU International Services for Students also has a mentorship program called the Global Connections Program. And that is, I think it's currently open to all students because of the pandemic, but usually it's open to students coming in with international pathways and you can be teamed up with a community leader who's your peer mentor, but you don't have to be. You're basically in this big community in your first year and they host events. When it's in person, they take you and show you around Vancouver. So if you're coming from outside of Canada, definitely look into that as well. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, next question was surrounding co-op and how does this work with the pandemic? 
Um, I can start answering that question there. If anyone has anything that they wanted to add, they can do that as well. So co-op is something, um, so this is where you get work experience. Essentially, it's a part of your program. You get to alternate your in-class learning um, with semesters of paid work experience. And you really, you get valuable work experience during your program so that when you graduate, you are um, ready to really hit the ground running. You have some experience on your resume, you get paid for it. It's a good opportunity for you to explore, maybe figure out what you like and what you don't like. And this is something, although it's not as big, but during the pandemic, it still happens. So there are a lot of employers who have shifted during the pandemic to offer their co-op opportunities remotely. And this is something that's been really neat because there are students who maybe haven't had the opportunity to go and work uh, out of province, for example, who are now able to do their co-op jobs remotely. Um, so there's a student who is doing a job with the federal government and this position is normally out in Ottawa, uh, but they were able to do it remotely uh, in their current location. So um, there are some opportunities that are definitely still available. Hopefully in the future, once everything is safely uh, opened up, co-op will then eventually go back into person. Um, right now, the co-op opportunities, they're still remote um, and there's still options available. Uh, for those of you who are just joining uh, this semester or fall coming up, you wouldn't be starting a co-op term in your first semester anyways. So uh, it is something that you can start to apply to uh, in your first year. Uh, if you're entering, if you're a transfer student and you're getting into your third year, apply ASAP. Uh, you want to make sure that you uh, enter into co-op as soon as you can um, because there is a credit limit um, that you um, have to have or before, I think it's pr prior to 75 units, you have to apply to it. Um, so for those of you who are just entering into your first year, don't worry, it's not something that you get into right away, um, but it can be something that you start looking into. I don't know if anybody has anything else to add into uh, terms of co-op um, or work experiences. I don't know if we've had any students who've been co-op students before. I'm just going to take a quick peek at the chat here and see what else we have for questions if anyone has anything to add. Emerald? I can say one thing quickly about co-op. Co-op has a minimum credit for you to apply technically, but if you apply in your first year, they don't turn you away. So by the end of my, by my third term, I had a co-op. So that is an option. You could, if you're really keen, you can, you can apply for the program right away and get in and do all your things and then get a job later on. Yes, I, sorry, it was a maximum of 75 units completed. Um, so you have to complete it before that. Um, but for those of you who are first year students, definitely look into applying in your first year. That way you can get going as soon as possible. All right, let's go and see what some of the next questions are here. Emma, for the FCP program, Bettina has put her email into the chat there. And we can actually get you connected with somebody in the French cohort program uh, directly. So make sure uh, you send an email to Bettina. I know that you may have missed some um, some of the information today, uh, but if you send her an email, we'll get you connected to somebody directly there. Uh, Abby, everybody has been noticing Pikachu in the background on yours, so lots of comments about Pikachu. Um, okay, next question here. Do you only get admitted to one campus or all? Does anybody want to answer that one? I can also answer it, but um, we can pass it on. All right, I'll take an answer at that one then. Um, so for that question there, if you applied specifically to the FAST1 program in Surrey, uh, you would be doing your classes um, in Surrey, but some students, they do have the opportunity to take some classes uh, on the other campuses as well. Um, but typically students will do all of them out of Surrey if they're part of that FAST1 Surrey program. Um, but you do have that flexibility. You're not admitted to per se a campus, uh, so when you go and you apply and, or go to enroll in your classes, you're choosing the campus that you want to take those classes. Okay, let me just see here. Does anybody have anything quickly that they wanted to add? I'm going to take a quick peek here at the chat again. All right, there is questions about whether the fall campus will be online um, or if it will be in person. Ash did put a link into the chat there about where you can keep up to date on the status for that. So there will be uh, an announcement in May. At the moment, we don't uh, have an answer just yet. So keep your eyes on the website and also um, be constantly checking your emails as well as that's how you will be receiving um, a lot of communications. Okay, lots of links into the chat there for the mentorship programs as well. 
Fast One Mentorship. Okay, I see there's 59 new messages, so I have a lot to go through. Um, does anybody want to add anything? Look and see if there's any questions that need to be answered or if anybody sees any questions in the chat here that they want to address. Um, while I just quickly peek to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, I'll say really quick that when I signed up for classes my first year, I didn't realize that you got to choose the different campuses. So I signed up for a class in Surrey, one in the Vancouver campus and one in the Burnaby campus, all while living on residency. So make sure to check that as well and don't make my mistake. It was really horrible. Thank you. Um, question here, I'm going to pass this on to Madison. Are you allowed to get an extension for accepting your offer? There was actually a couple of questions about this. So um, I'll pass that on to Madison. It might've been answered in the chat. So right now we will not be lapsing any offers, but we really are encouraging you to accept your offer by the May 1st deadline, just because we cannot guarantee past the May 1st deadline if the program seats do fill up. So we really are encouraging by the May 1st, but um, offers currently will not be canceled. Um, I will put my email and you can reach out to me as well and we can figure that out for you. Awesome. Yes, thank you. If you if your questions did get lost in the chat, like I said, I had 59 that I had to read through. So you can just put it again at the bottom. I've made it to the bottom now. Um, so we'll answer Megan's here. Um, okay, if you don't live on residence, are there options for overnight residence if you need to study uh, late at night? Does anybody have any answers for that one or what they do maybe for late night studying. There's a lot of current students in here, so um, you can address how you do your late night studying on campus. Usually if I'm late night studying on campus, I'm not sleeping, <laughs> but we do have a hotel on campus, but you have to book it and it costs money. Other than that, um, you can take naps maybe on your student union room couch but there's no set areas for you to have overnight stays. The Women's Center though does have a, a safe area for non-binary and women individuals who would like a safe space that's locked, that has a kitchen that you can go in and make snacks while you're studying. That's another option as well. In the student union building that is opening as well in the fall, there is a nap room. I don't believe you can stay there overnight, but you can take naps. There's like nap pods that will be available for students. I just don't think you can stay overnight. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question here, it is six o'clock. So um, I will make sure to address your questions here, um, but I knew I know some of our reps do have to leave so quickly. Um, before we answer the rest of the questions here, I just want to give a big round of applause to all of our advisors, current students and professors who joined us here today and say thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening to um, debate these very important topics that we've all been really wanting to get answers to and we've all been thinking about these. Um, thank you all so much. We greatly appreciate you um, and enjoy your night. For those of you who still want to stick around, there are some questions that we're going to address here um, before I uh, pass it on um, or before we sign off. So uh, don't leave if you have questions that still need to be addressed. But for those of you who have to go, thank you so much. And congratulations to everybody who has to leave on your offer as well. We're very excited for you. And we really hope to uh, see you on campus one day when we're all, all safely able to return to campus. Um, so Thank you. And I will continue with answering some of the questions here. And no, this is not a weird question. <laughs> Someone said, is it? This might be a weird question. Um, but are the notes that you take in class mainly written or are they typed? What works better for you? This can be an individual question, but for some of the current students we have here, what's your best uh, way to take notes in class? What works best for you? I answered this question on the chat, but I, I can reiterate it. Personally, for me, I really like typing because I remember trying to write notes once in class and I couldn't keep up <laughs> because of like the words that come out sometimes like go really fast and, with like certain professors. And so I prefer typing, but I do know there are some props that don't allow certain devices. And so that's something that you might wanna check out and prepare um, in the future, but that is what works for me. 
Thank you so much. Awesome. I'm seeing a ton of thank yous in the chat. So that could be uh, me thinking it's a lot of new questions coming in. A lot of people are now going to go have hot dogs, which is awesome. Um, maybe some of you will go out and buy hot dog toasters now. Um, okay, I don't see. Can you turn your camera on and ask questions? Yeah, you feel free. Um, you can definitely turn your camera on. I don't know if we have the ability right now, but what we can always do is give you that ability um, to unmute yourself. David, you're welcome. I am so happy Hi. that we were able Sorry to, to cut answer. you off. Yeah, no worries. Uh, my name is Mujtaba, and I just had a quick question uh, to the students, I guess. What, what, how would you describe like a day in the life of a student, you know, starting from, I guess, the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep? Like, how would a daily, you know, day in the life be, especially for a crime student, I guess, if there's any crime students here, because I, myself, I'm thinking about going into criminology. So I was just wondering if any of the CRIM students could just, you know, give me an idea of what I what I have to expect going into SFU. Thank you. I don't know if we have any CRIM students here with us, um, but we can always have students talk about their student experience and answer um, just in in general. <clears throat> yeah, I don't Does think any of us are CRIM students, but I can go and talk you through like a day in an online life for me and then maybe one of the other students can talk about like a day in the life before we had to go online um but for me i really try to make a difference between home life and work life even though we're doing all of it from you know the same place um so i like to wake up i have a morning routine i always change my clothes to make sure that you know i'm not spending the whole day in my pajamas uh drink coffee or tea i'm neutral on that debate and then i'll sit at my desk and i'll usually do about two or three hours of work stop for lunch um, and then maybe two or three more hours. I really try to finish all my work before 5 p.m. because I cannot concentrate in the evenings and I also like to have that time for guilt-free Netflix and just relaxing. Um, so I'm definitely more productive in the morning. I focus most of my work at that time, but I think it's really individual. And if you're someone who's a night owl and works really well between the hours of 10 p.m. and 1 a.m., which I definitely know people like that, you can make your schedule around your productive um, period there. Uh, that's kind of nice a uh, benefit of being at home is you can really be flexible with your schedule. Um, does anyone else want to talk about like an in-person day in the life sort of thing? I'll go with that. Um, so before, um, I, I am the type of person who doesn't like to take too many morning classes. So I like to wake up maybe like an hour before I have to leave just so I can, you know, not rush having my breakfast, you know, getting ready. And then I take transit for about an hour and 10 minutes <laughs> because traffic. Um, so I get to the campus and usually I have, I have class. I try to time it around my lunch break. So I have time for lunch. And then depending on what day it is, depending on if I have a student union meeting, depending on if I have maybe, I'm also involved in the choir. We have a choir if anybody's interested, SFU choir. Um, I time it around, you know, doing my homework and I would recommend getting a planner because that has made my life so much easier. So I try to do, I try to do my homework maybe a day or two days before everything's due. And I try to do it at campus because I feel more motivated to do it. Um, usually in the library, because the library has really great places to study and places that are quiet, that'd be a good recommendation. Um, and then I'm basically done for the, I basically done for the day. So that's really the, the a life in my day. Dude. Some days I go right until like 2.30, other days it's till 5.30, maybe later, depending on when, when I have choir and meetings. So just type it around your schedule. If you're not a morning person, don't take morning classes. If you're don't like taking classes in the evening, don't take evening classes. If you'd rather, put all of your schedule on two days and then have the rest of the week free, then do that. You know, fit, fit it to what works best for you, not work what works best for everybody else, so. Awesome, thank you guys so much. This is greatly appreciated. Um, so just to quickly, there was a question in the chat there um, about what do you do next? And this might be a spot where everybody is at here and where we could um, actually transition and end the event. Um, so. 
Some of you may have already paid your deposit. Some of you may not have paid your deposit, um, but you all should have received an offer by this point. So first off, congratulations again on your offer. Um, make sure that you do confirm or accept your offer prior to that May 1st deadline. Uh, ideally, as Madison mentioned, um, we would like everybody to do that. Um, we won't be lapsing offers past that May 1st deadline, but again, we, we would prefer if you, if you did accept your offer before that deadline. You will get access on this online platform that we have called Canvas. Check your emails for that. Um, you will get something called University Prep. Uh, and it's called, um, you'll have, it's two parts. So there's step one, and that's just going to be introducing you to a little bit of SFU. Uh, in June sometime, you'll get access to the second part of that, which is going to be step two. Um, there was a link put into the chat of the timeline where you can see where all of this information comes out as well as the important dates and deadlines. Um, so make sure you do enroll in your university prep. Again, as it, as it sounds, the title, it's university prep. It's helping prepare you for university. So um, that would be one thing to recommend. And also, for those of you who are currently in high school or even in college and university, you do still have to maintain your grades. So it's important to finish up with the coursework that you have uh, now. And those of you who are just starting maybe your quarter four, really focus on doing well in those classes and finishing up high school or your college and university. Um, that's probably the biggest thing to worry about now is just making sure you maintain your grades. Uh, in June sometime, that's when you'll get invited to the academic advising sessions to help you with your course planning. Lots of links are put in the chat for where to find that information or how to connect with the academic advisors. So make sure you do that. July is when you enroll in courses and then it kind of goes on from there. So um, the undergrad, the new undergraduate page that was linked in the chat, that's where you're going to find your, you'll find a link on how to accept your offer of admission. You'll also find the upcoming events, including which would have been this one, as well as our next event, which is on May 5th. And that's where you're going to be introduced to some of our FAST alumni. So these are going to be graduates from our FAST programs you'll get to hear a little bit about their journeys and some of the careers that they're doing now as well, because that's always a big question is, what am I even gonna do with my degree? What kind of jobs can I get? So you'll get to hear about some of those um, journeys from some of our alumni and then the careers that they're in. And then the final one that we already talked about is on May 19th, and that's where you get to meet your FAST year one advisors. So uh, make sure you register for those events. Any questions you have, you can always send me an email. Again, my name is Caitlin, um, or you can also email uh, some of our fantastic advisors, Megan and Rachel, who have also been linked in the chat. Um, Layla, I think I just answered your question. Is there anything left to do after accepting and paying your de deposit? Focus on your grades now, do really well in your classes and pay attention to the timeline that we had there. Um, lastly, before I let you all go, we have been sending out packages in the mail. These are fast welcome packages. Some of you may have already received these, which is really exciting. Some of you may not have gotten them yet, um, but these are little packages to welcome you into fast. And there's going to be some postcards. So you'll see Mizuki and Abby, who you met here today. You'll see their faces. You'll also see the faces of our advisors. Um, and in these welcome packages, we have five golden tickets. So if anybody's seen Willy Wonka, you will know what a golden ticket is. We have five golden tickets that have been randomly placed into these packages that have gone out in the mail. So if you get a golden ticket in your package, you get a $50 um, gift card to, I believe it's the bookstore. So make sure you follow the instructions on um, the golden ticket if you got one to claim your prize. And yes, international students will also receive welcome packages. We have been sending it to everybody. We heard a couple of weeks ago that there were students in um, India who had already started to receive theirs. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us here today. I will put my name or sorry, my email in the chat and I'll also change my name to my email again. So if you have any questions, you can just send me an email.